Oh, hello, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and thank you for joining this webinar, um, on which is um, on the issue of child trafficking. Um, and we, when we said the date, we didn't think about this, but then I realized that today is also International Children's Day, at least in uh, in the former communist countries. It's very widely celebrated. It's also sometimes referred to as Children's Rights Day or Child Protection Day. So it seems appropriate uh, that we are holding this webinar today where we will we'll be discussing issues of um, child trafficking, migration, uh, labor, uh, surrogacy, and so broadly speaking, children's rights. So with this, let me introduce myself first. My name is Borislav Gerasimov. My short name is Bobby, uh, and I'm the uh, communications and advocacy coordinator of, at the Global Alliance Against Trafficking Women. Uh, we are an international NGO network uh, that collectively advocates for the rights of migrants uh, and trafficked persons. One of the uh, activities that we, uh, one of the many activities that we do, uh, and I'm, uh, is uh, we publish uh, the Anti-Trafficking Review, which is an open access peer reviewed journal that focuses on the issue of human trafficking in its broader context and intersections with gender, migration, labor, and development. The journal is open access and peer reviewed. Um, uh, we publish, the, the journal publishes two issues per year in uh, April and September. And each issue is on a specific topic that we have identified as under-researched uh, and uh, current or emerging, and each issue has a guest editor who is an academic. Tonight's event, we are going to be speaking about uh, the issue which we published in April this year, which was on the theme of trafficking in minors and guest edited by Brenda Aldebrail. Uh, and with that, uh, I will uh, move to introduce our speakers. Uh, so it's my uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Brenda Aldebrail, who is a senior lecturer at the Willem Pompe Institute for Criminal Law and Criminology at the Utrecht University in the Netherlands. Mike Dotrich, who is an independent expert based in the United Kingdom. Sam Ochier, who is a social anthropologist and senior lecturer in sociology at the School of Sociology, Politics and International Studies at the University of Bristol in the UK. Elena Krasmanovic, who is Assistant Professor of Criminology at the Faculty of Law at the Utrecht University in the Netherlands. Catherine Sotis and Madeleine Taylor Diaz, Supervising Immigration Attorneys at the NGO Ayuda in the United States. And Nishat Haider Rahman, who is a bioethicist and medical lawyer in the Netherlands. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here. So I, I want to... Um, start with you, Brenda, because you are the guest editor of this issue and you are one of the people who helped conceptualize it. So as I mentioned, the theme is trafficking in minors. Why, can you tell us why it is important to study uh, this topic and focus a special issue of the journal uh, at this time? I can surely tell you that, Bobby. On the one hand, we could say that this um, special issue came very timely. As Bobby already mentioned, um, we, uh, 2021 has been called uh, out as the International Year for the Elimination of Child Labor by the UN General Assembly. Um, and on top of that, today is the International um, Children's Day in many countries. So we could say that is a good timing of this special issue. But on the other hand, we could wonder uh, why didn't it come about much earlier? Because if we look at, um, at the debate on human trafficking, ever since there was serious concern and political um, shock and, and reaction to um, the phenomenon of human trafficking, children appeared kind of central stage to this political discourse, uh, raising the political stakes, of course, because uh, as soon as children are involved, uh, children are kind of political currency. There is a, immediately a, a moral and a, um, uh, there is immediately a lot of also emotional and sensational 
um, images and, and appearing in people's minds, uh, raising the stakes um, in this discourse and in this phenomenon. Um, I would say that that situation, that very politicized situation and the sensationalized images that we see on trafficking in minors, uh, to which Elena will, Elena Krasmano, which in her contribution will go into a bit further, um, I would say that situation hindered rather than helped the in-depth, decent, academic uh, study of uh, trafficking in minors. We could say that there is not so much knowledge yet available on trafficking in minors. That is to say that there is uh, quite a lot about um, trafficking in minors for sexual exploitation, but we are lagging behind in information and data, decent in-depth data on um, other forms of trafficking in minors. For example, trafficking in minors for labor exploitation, for exploitation of criminal activities, begging, or new forms of trafficking in minors. And that is due to uh, actually on the one hand, what we just discussed, this very politicized uh, nature of the topic and the fact that uh, much of the research that has been done uh, has been done as part and parcel of these politics of trafficking and therefore lack um, either academic rigor or it lacks the critical questions that we should ask. Another reason why there is a little empirical research on the phenomenon is that, as you can imagine, it's methodologically and ethically uh, very complex. Um, methodologically, um, because of course, this is a very taboo topic and gaining access to the research population of young people therefore is very complex. Uh, gaining access to the research population of perpetrators is maybe even more complex. Um, and ethically, it's also um, um, very complex as many academic institutions, for example, have high ethical standards, especially when it concerns uh, involving minors in your research. So there is a lot of complexities there. And besides these methodological complexities and against this background of this very politicized uh, nature of this uh, phenomenon, especially when it concerns minors, um, there is another challenge to research, which is that it is uh, very complex, it has turned out to be very complex to address critically the social, economic, and political root causes of the phenomenon. And I'm talking there about geopolitical, but also uh, interpersonal power, structural power inequalities um, that unfold um, concerning this phenomenon. And we need to address those structural causes because if we do not do that, we risk uh, designing policies or campaigns that actually go only skin deep and that address mainly um, the cosmetic uh, aspects of the phenomenon, um, but they do not uh, come up with structural solutions. And they might even eventually do harm rather than support the children and the minors in this situation who find themselves in this situation, which is clearly elaborated on in um, the article in the special issue of Bernard Crimson and um, Dawuda Abdullahi, but also, for example, in the article of uh, Sam uh, Okiere and Nana Agiman and, and Emmanuel Saboro. So um, in sum, um, to respond to your question, Bobby, why is this special issue so important? Well, first of all, because we lack knowledge on the phenomenon and the knowledge that we do have is generally quite biased, either um, overshadowed by uh, information on sex trafficking and not on the other forms or part and parcel of this politicized discourse and therefore uh, does not always critically address these structural power inequalities that are so at the basis of this phenomenon. So what this issue mainly intends to point out is that there are many kinds of exploitative conditions that children can find themselves in, and children exhibit 
different degrees of autonomy, of agency, of sovereignty in dealing with these conditions, depending on their positioning in the social fabric with all its inequalities. And we should address this context much more than we currently do. And that's why we made the special issue. Thank you, Brenda, for this really good uh, summary of the <clears throat> Uh, of some of the guiding uh, idea or some of the thoughts behind behind the issue. So with that, I will turn to Mike Dotridge. Um, Mike, your, your article is titled Between Theory and Reality, the Challenge of Distinguishing Between Trafficked Children and Independent Child Migrants. And in it, you, you critique three countries for their failure to distinguish between child trafficking and independent migration by adolescents. Tell us more about the main issue you, you identified uh, during your uh, long experience. Thank you very much, Bobby, and thanks for the opportunity to talk to everyone today. Well, I suppose, although I've focused on three countries, I've tried to reflect a little bit, uh, some experience over 25 years, starting on uh, a focus in the mid-90s on children working away from home and ways of improving their situation or stopping them being beaten black and blue in, in the case particularly of child domestic workers. Um, but I've seen the power dynamics, I suppose exactly what Brenda was referring to, uh, really affects uh, good, well-motivated initiatives repeatedly. Um, I've seen international organizations that seem um, incapable of even considering what is the best interest of the child because their backers, their sponsors, their internal policies say, oh, uh, child labor is never uh, acceptable in any situation. They don't then look and see, well, actually is a child escaping uh, a bad situation into something a little bit better, which we might now call trafficking, but which uh, oftentimes from the child's point of view is an improvement. So, so these are the, a little bit the background considerations that led me to, to uh, produce an article about two very different situations. One in the West African Republic of Benin, once called Dahomey, concerning girls working away from home, mainly in their own country, as domestic servants in the houses of others. Um, this has been going on for many decades. It was only uh, in the early 2000s that it was branded as a form of trafficking and the government started satisfying the demands of various donors, particularly in the United States of America, to react by passing a series of laws which frankly are, uh, uh, are not even well-intentioned. They're pretty stupid. Uh, and they haven't affected uh, or benefited much the children concerned. And then uh, the second group that I focused on are uh, Vietnamese children arriving in my own country. Why, why you might immediately ask, how do Vietnamese children get to, to the United Kingdom? Well, they do, hundreds have come each year for the past uh, decade. Um, and uh, you could say the, it's only the lucky ones who get labeled as traffic children and get some degree of protection from the authorities in the United Kingdom. But in both cases, I wanted to look at whether the use of this concept of trafficking, which is initially there mainly to prosecute criminals rather than to protect um, children who are uh, uh, experiencing some sort of ha harm and damage, whether it's been useful, whether it um, really addresses anything, whether it's root causes, or indeed the need for children who are away from home to have uh, easy access to some sort of assistance and protection. Um, and in neither of the two cases, I'm afraid, do I uh, come across uh, very positive outcomes. In the Benin case, as I've implied, I thought I was back in the 19th century. And that's because in Brazil in the 19th century, for about 50 years, they used the expression for the English to see when they were referring to their anti-slavery law. For 50 years uh, after the insistence of the United Kingdom that Brazil should prohibit 
uh, the import of slaves. Uh, they had a law which was absolutely unimplemented, but it satisfied those English gentlemen in London who insisted that uh, the, the slave trade should be stopped. Uh, and these days, I suppose, in Benin, I thought it's for the Americans to see. It's a bit for uh, certain UN organizations to see, whether it's the UN Office on, on Drugs and Crime or, or UNICEF. But the problem is it's not to benefit children. And unless it's to benefit children, it's well nigh criminal. Um, to comment briefly on, on, on Vietnam, uh, Vietnam is the opposite to Benin. They haven't really been concerned about internal trafficking or the worst forms of child labor in, in Vietnam itself. The Vietnamese authorities haven't. Um, and to begin with, they very much only acknowledged cases of uh, commercial sexual exploitation as, as being one that involved trafficking. But uh, eventually they got um, bored by uh, endless messages coming from London saying, we're receiving uh, a lot of Vietnamese here. We don't want them. Uh, now we're, we're receiving Vietnamese children who are growing cannabis here in secret places, and we don't want them either. Please, could you stop them coming? Um, and in the UK, uh, it took uh, a good five years for the authorities themselves to register within the criminal justice system that if they came across a 15-year-old boy sitting in a house with all the windows blocked out and artificial lights, uh, watering cannabis and probably, you know, looking at the television, reading uh, porn magazines, nothing else to do, not allowed out. You know, that this was not the case of a willful criminal who had traveled halfway around the world. It really did require a child protection response. And that's been organized by calling the child trafficked. But it hasn't resulted in any uh, decline in the number of children coming. It hasn't resulted in what was originally intended by the concept of trafficking in persons in criminals being put about behind bars, it's resulted in a sort of, uh, um, no, it, 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 it's a kind of waste of resources that, that just hasn't led to meaningful change. Uh, where we have seen uh, a, an impact on the ongoing pattern of a regular migration of Vietnamese into the UK, was with a terrible tragedy at the end of 2019 when 39 Vietnamese suffocated in a lorry. Three of them were children, another seven were uh, young adults aged 18 and 19. Um, and that the, the huge amount of publicity given to that has been a disincentive to young Vietnamese traveling specifically to the United Kingdom. Um, what hasn't been much use has been endless anti-trafficking adverts put up around uh, Vietnam, which use this word trafficking, which in Vietnam, as in so many other places, doesn't register with local people as anything that they know about, experience, or expect. So it's using the wrong words to convey the wrong message to both young migrants and everyone else who wants to have a better future. Same thing in Benin. Uh, um, uh, as, instead of the law leading to substantial change, um, it's really done nothing substantial to address the heart of the problem, which is not that children leave home, not that children work, but rather that some working children are, as I said at the beginning, beaten black and blue, are mistreated, and that the authorities don't have a meaningful system to protect them. Uh, and that's partly because, again, at international level, there's a view of the world that says there should be no child labor. So we don't need to protect working children. I mean, it's, it's so convoluted, so uh, uh, stupid, that it drives me mad. You know, it really is uh, now 22 years since I helped organize a global march against child labor. And uh, I think most of the policies and most of the money spent on those policies in the last 22 years has been um, going in the wrong way. So I'm always hoping for a better future. Thanks very much for your attention. I also had a second question. If you can share, you know, briefly um, any 
you know, any positive policies or uh, measures that you've seen or that you think would have more impact than uh, the ones you were describing until now? Well, the, the first one uh, goes straight on from what I was saying. More effective protection for working children rather than just a no child labor refrain, which we'll hear a lot about this month. Um, in the case of child domestic workers, whether it's in the Republic of Benin or the tens of millions, mainly girls, working uh, in the houses of other people, uh, it means addressing seriously uh, how they are treated, establishing minimum standards, enforcing those standards. It's been done in some places, it can be done, it can work. In a way, it follows it closely in the path of the ILO Convention on Domestic Work that was saying that we can't just ignore the fact that there are many tens of millions of domestic workers and pretend that this is not the world of work. Clearly, uh, it needs uh, some sort of uh, enforcement of minimum standards as to other areas. But in terms of pushing children out to emigrate away from home, away from um, a very poor village in Benin or a medium income level village in Vietnam where the, the uh, adolescents see no real prospects. Well, of course, the first thing is uh, meaningful alternatives near to home. It means not a criminal justice approach, but a de development one. And unfortunately, uh, the last five years has seen not only in my country, but especially in my country, more and more uh, raw uh, threatening people, justice, uh, instead of uh, the slow drip drip of development efforts. Um, and, and that's very sad. Social protection in certain areas where uh, ch children who are highly uh, likely to be trafficked are based, social protection measures involving social services have proved effective in some places uh, to give parts of Southeast Europe. Um, usually it's uh, at the initiative of non-governmental uh, organizations which have a bit more uh, uh, experience of working outside the office and in the community. Uh, but there are all sorts of things that have been done and can be uh, done there. And then uh, protection along the routes of travel, not just for traffic children, but any uh, unaccompanied children or, or uh, uh, children in, in precarious situations, uh, keeping the sharks away from them, as it were. And, and we've seen that huge need uh, in Southeast Europe in the last uh, few years, uh, particularly uh, when a million odd uh, people were on the road in uh, 2015. And basically the conventional protection services by UN organizations, by national governments fell to pieces straight away. They were hopeless. Um, so yes, there's plenty that can be done, but it requires a willingness to do it rather than looking in the wrong direction and saying, oh, the, the solution is over there somewhere when it's not. Thank you, Mike. I think this is um, uh, a common thread that appears in many of the articles, including uh, in the one by Sam, for which I will invite him now to to speak. Um, so Sam, your, the title of your article is, why was he videoing us? Um, uh, the ethics of, and politics of audiovisual propaganda in child trafficking and human trafficking campaigns. And there you focus on some very problematic practices uh, of anti-trafficking NGOs in Ghana. Yeah, please tell us more about it. Thank you very much, Bobby. Um, I'm very pleased to have been part of this um, important special issue. So the starting point for our paper um, was an incident which, which occurred in 2017. Um, as some of you may be aware, um, an issue that has um, occupied, I think, um, uh, part of the international child rights, child trafficking debate in the last decade is the um question of um whether um children um well the the, the the mainstream analysis or argument is that there is widespread child trafficking um on the lake volta of 
Ghana. This issue has featured in several documentaries on um, international news channels such as CNN and the BBC. And increasingly, there are documentary films and campaigns and messages by um, various NGOs such as the International Justice Mission, Challenge and Height, and others portraying um, images and videos of children who have been um, supposedly um, rescued from trafficking and enslavement on the Volta Lake of Ghana. Now in 2017, um, the Member of Parliament for um, the area which involves some of these um, islands, and just by way of context, we're talking about um, quite remote um, indigenous communities, riverine um, islands, which um, I will explain, I have ex we, we have explained my co-authors and I in the paper um, that are really very marginalized in um, the um, context in which the research took place. Now in 2017, the member of parliament for the area um, charged, you know, lamented the fact that about 140 or so children from um, her constituencies, in her words, um, have been kidnapped by um, the Ghanaian Anti-Trafficking Police Unit and the International Justice Mission. Um, and she was referring to um, an anti-trafficking raid which had been carried out across several of the remote islands during which around 140 or so children had been taken from their families and parents under the guise um, pretext of saving or rescuing them from um, child trafficking. Now, these raids, as we discussed in the paper, have become a very important aspect of the modalities being employed by the um, IJM and the Ghanaian anti-trafficking units. And it takes place basically, as some of you are aware, in this case, um, the islanders told us that sometimes you could be um, on the lake. Now, the lake itself is pretty much where every activity, these are islands, so the lake is where almost every activity takes place. The lake is the motorway, the highway, the marketplace, is the recreation ground is pretty much where every social activity um, on these islands take place. So people in our research informed us of the fact that sometimes you could be, you know, in the in a boat or a canoe with your child and suddenly you find um, speed boats with gun totting police officers swooping down on you, um, your children, you know, snatched from you sometimes very violently. Um, and, you know, sometimes families thrown into jail for um, having, in um, scare quotes, trafficked their own children. Um, this incident involved um, 144 children taken from their families, um, following which there, there were um, media reports of successful anti-trafficking campaigns on the island, you know, celebrating these um, rescue operations. Um, after a year following investigations, it transpired that 140 of the children had simply been taken away from their relatives with whom they were um, fishing for subsistence and for other family reasons. And so contrary to the widespread claims of widespread um, child trafficking, um, it transpired, at least from this incident, that um, nothing of that sort was taking place. Um, and what this paper or paper wanted to bring to light, therefore, was the, um, the issue of accountability um, or the lack of accountability in these anti-trafficking raids, first of all, but also how, you know, the, the road to hell is paved with good intentions sometimes. So there's this noble idea of promoting children's rights, which we argue in our paper, um, has been um, in effect undermined by the fact that um, hyper-emotional and sensationalized representations have taken precedence of our careful research and analysis of the problem. Now, the problem, as we discuss in the paper, isn't so much that children have been trafficked, but because, as our um, research participants, the islanders told us, 
um, their marginalization and exclusion from um, developmental opportunities in the country means that fishing or training their children on how to fish or how to know, you know, how to work on the lake is, is vitally important. Um, on these islands, there aren't any jobs in IT or any other formal occupations. There are three main jobs that one can do if you lived on the islands, fishing, farming and charcoal burning. Um, there aren't any schools either. So one of the things which we found, you know, quite paradoxical was that um, parents who were arrested during the raids were accused of preventing or denying um, their children access to um, schooling. Um, and yet there aren't any schools on the islands. In fact, we did our research on five islands Three of them had no schools at all. And as Bobby's pictures, um, the pictures Bobby is screening um, on, this, on, on, on the slides there shows, um, these are very impoverished and, and marginalized islands. So when we spoke with the islanders in relation to the claims that are made about their islands, we found that in fact, many of them didn't actually know that you know these narratives and discourses are circulated about them these narratives and discourses which we see in the documentary films and in the report and elsewhere because again apart from electricity um, apart from the lack of um, infrastructure such as schools there's also the lack of in you know in internet access electricity and others and so all they know is that the police raid the islands they spoke about, you know, the white man with the camera in reference to um, a gentleman who works with the IJM, who they say was videoing what was happening, videoing the fact that some of the parents were being brutalized, children clinging onto their parents in fear. Because obviously, if any of us suddenly had gun totting police officers, people who claim they are police, again, the island just had no way of verifying. So you've had speedboats swooping down on your canoes, almost capsizing some of them, people pulling gun out, showing you ID cards, purporting to be police officers and asking your children to get onto their boats. A lot of fear there. Um, so the islanders were telling us that throughout this process, you had someone with a video camera capturing their dehumanization and um, abuse and therefore asking us throughout the process, why were they videoing us? What was the purpose of, of this um, recording which was going on? And in, in, in the course of the project, we had to show them some of the film, some of the narrative, some of the ideas that are being promoted in the outside world about you know life and socialization of children in their communities to which they were quite um, angry in terms of their response because they vehemently deny that their children are being exploited or abused or trafficked. They tell us instead that it is a lack of social welfare opportunities and developmental opportunities, which mean that actually they have, they find it more logical to ensure that their children know how to fish or know how to work on the lake. Because um, a child who grows up lacking these skills basically faces immense challenges in the future. There aren't any other livelihood opportunities. So this was one major aspect of the problem. And the point we make is that there ought to be more understanding of the lived experiences of islanders, you know, these islanders, because at the current time, the issue is quite, you know, is very much dominated by the perspectives of the NGOs and uh, mainstream media accounts, which, as I indicated, um, mean well. Um, however, they are mainly driven by sensationalism over careful analysis of the problem. And the responses, again, require attention to the issues which the islanders pointed out to us as we try to capture through the images they asked us to take to show to the outside world, you know, their living conditions and how improving these can also help improve other aspects of their children's lives. Thank you, Sam. This was um, 
really interesting and very interesting quotes, uh, very interesting descriptions of the experiences of the islanders. Um, now I turn to Elena. Um, in a, in a way, your, your article uh, also focuses on problematic representations of child trafficking, but uh, in media articles in the UK. Uh, yeah, tell us what you found in your research. Where do I start? Uh, yeah, um, well, maybe from the beginning, I, I uh, the article I've written for the ATR uh, comes from somewhat of uh, an anomaly from my previous research, a set of data that I couldn't treat. Um, basically, what I was observing uh, some five years ago uh, was how media uh, represent human trafficking for sexual exploitation in general in several locations, UK included. And while discourses of the media and the implications of, of it that were discussed in my research, so whether human trafficking is um, equated with prostitution or whether it's represented as a criminalization or a criminal justice issue or whether it's something that has to do with migration, et cetera, um, there was a big portion of data in the UK media uh, that was treating uh, human trafficking um, as child sexual exploitation. Um, and this was specific to the case of UK. Um, so I knew then that at some point I have to zoom into these articles um, and see really why is ch child sexual exploitation being equated with human trafficking? Are there any differences between uh, articles that are focusing on these uh, specific cases and those who talk about uh, child trafficking, et cetera? Um, so I did that in, in this article, and there are a lot of things that I found, but basically the, there is a big difference um, in how uh, media talk about trafficking cases that involve minors who are citizens of the UK and trafficking cases who involve uh, minors who come from elsewhere and are exploited in the United Kingdom. So child sexual exploitation uh, is taken to mean uh, exploitation of local young white girls by traffickers who are foreigners who are Muslim and come from Asian communities in the UK. Um, so what is noticeable here in this narrative is, uh, at least for those who are in anti-trafficking world, it sounds familiar, right? It sounds like the white slavery myth. So they follow this narrative of foreign men coming their problems, etc. And this reporting is really one-sided, it's stereotypical, oversimplified. Um, and uh, of course, it promotes, uh, uh, it, it provides discrimination uh, grounds uh, for uh, whole communities of Asian Muslim men. Um, of course, the problem here is that um, if you dig deeper into these cases and in these narratives, and you compare, for instance, writings of different media outlets, you will notice that these men are labeled as foreign in most of the articles, but then you'll find several or you'll find court cases where you actually see that these are British citizens who have been in Britain usually for generations, but who have foreign origin. They, their grandparents or great-grandparents came to the UK um, and uh, they've never been to Pakistan or any other country, uh, but they are labeled as foreign. So that really uh, gives grounds to a lot of discrimination, a lot of racism, um, and, and a lot of um, underlying factors that actually might push minority communities to commit crime in the first place. And when it comes to law enforcement, of course, uh, they can focus on policing these groups and neglect neglecting others. And that can reflect poorly on identifying cases of human trafficking and helping victims of human trafficking. Um, and when I looked at how victims are uh, uh, um, talked about, uh, there is also a difference where uh, the British victims are are always represented as extremely young, white, um, and that there is, of course, this whole stereotype of the ideal victim that is being perpetuated in this, these articles. Um, on the other hand, if I compare these articles with articles that were dealing with um, human trafficking survivors who are non-British citizens who are identified on British territories, um, we see a lot of differences. Uh, here, media are focused on 
uh, talking about the rights of British miners, how they were um, let down by the social welfare system, by the state agencies, by the police, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there is a lot of talk what needs to be done to improve the mechanism, to help them out, to protect their rights, to prevent this from happening in the future, etc. In the articles that are focused on non-British children, the accent is on prosecuting traffickers. So very easily, this narrative creates the idea that to achieve justice for non-British minors, we only need to put their traffickers behind bars. And if we don't talk about their rights, uh, of course, um, we might end up having problems of inadequate uh, protection of these victims and differential treatment of victims uh, based on their um, nationality. Um, so multiple things are problematic here, from promoting stereotypes on perpetrators uh, and survivors of human trafficking to promoting differential treatment of victims based on their nationality. And finally, there is also an issue with, you know, the UK being the self-proclaimed um, global leader in fighting modern slavery. I hate this term, but that's how they call themselves. Um, whereas we heard from Mike that they critique other countries for not protecting children uh, from being trafficked in, in the UK. Okay, like the case of Vietnam, but for the very same children, they are doing very little to protect them from being exploited there. So I think there is also that level, um, if you want to call it macro or whatever, um, uh, that we need to problematize uh, speaking of these things. Yeah. Thank you so much, Elena. Um, and I, I will move on to Brenda now because in, in a way her article also points out the differential treatment to victims who are nationals or non-nationals and, and in her article also like, like you were saying with the, the framing of traffickers as Asian men uh, or Muslims, um, there is something similar in, uh, in Brenda's article. So I move on to you, Bren, now. Your article is titled Little Rascals or Not So Ideal Victims Dealing with Minors Trafficked for Exploitation in Criminal Activities in the Netherlands. Uh, and yeah, as, as the title suggests, uh, another, um, your article focuses on also on a form of trafficking that's not uh, very common or well known. So please tell us more. Before I go into my article, I have to say that uh, if I ever slip the tongue saying my research, I first have to make uh, the remark that this research was done in um, uh, most of the data was assembled in 2016 and it was a research together with um, Veronica Notch, Kim Loyens and Alina Bos. So we were the four of us. Um, back then when we started that research, uh, the phenomenon in the Netherlands was actually largely unknown unheard of, the phenomenon of um, trafficking in minors um, for exploitation of criminal activity. I must say uh, worldwide, it was, like I said in the beginning, um, the phenomenon of trafficking for criminal exploitation, so exploiting children by having them do criminal activities, um, worldwide is a lot overshadowed. There's not a lot of data on it. But in the Netherlands, uh, the phenomenon was largely unheard of. Um, there were two um, research reports that were very old and there were five cases tried in courts in the Netherlands at that moment. Uh, however, there were also some, what we call soft signals from first line professionals and coming from municipalities um, who had, um, quite a large um, so-called Roma population in their municipalities. And I say so-called Roma population because I can hardly um, verify whether these were actually Roma populations because when talking about Roma, these first-line professionals and policymakers and politicians would throw on one heap uh, both itinerant groups, uh, Roma groups, resident groups of Roma or um, or Sinti, for example, but also mixed up uh, Roma populations with itinerant groups coming from Central and Eastern Europe that were not necessarily Roma. So the whole word of Roma was actually a label and a stigma that, um, that, that was present there. Um, so there were some soft signals coming from these municipalities 
that um, trafficking in children for exploitation and criminal activities was taking place in these communities. And actually the whole request for this research to come about in the first place was a follow-up or a, a, um, a result of a Dutch national project on how to approach the Roma minority in our country. And as you can imagine, when the research starts from that um, ethnicized uh, context, you can imagine that uh, in the Netherlands, we encounter an ethnici ethnicized uh, conceptualization of uh, trafficking in minors for exploitation of criminal activities, meaning that this phenomenon um, was actually seen as a Roma problem and only seen as such. That uh, turned out in our research in quite uh, explicit ways because whenever we would, we would ask uh, first-line professionals to give us exemplary cases of exploitation of minors in criminal activities, they would come up with only uh, cases uh, of what they called were Roma. Um, and as academics and um, having read quite a lot, uh, well, uh, most of what there was about this phenomenon, um, we were pretty sure that it was not uh, limited to the Roma population. So we started, we had to start to actively look ourselves through the police files and the Child Protection Board files for cases that were non-Roma. And of course, we found uh, many of them. Well, many, we found them. Um, but it's, it's quite indicative how, um, how, res how hesitant uh, first-line professionals were to accept that this was not a Roma phenomenon. Um, if I give you the example of, um, uh, we had two cases that were kind of comparable, one of um, a Roma family in, which uh, used their children to do shoplifting uh, for well, survival uh, goals, so for stealing food and drink and stuff. And we had a similar case of a native Dutch uh, mother um, um, who sent her daughter out to steal for similar goals. Uh, it was quite telling that the Roma case was seen as um, child trafficking and uh, the follow-up was actually a criminal, uh, criminal law approach uh, whereby um, uh, the, the parents were brought uh, to court. Whereas the Dutch case, um, even when we asked the frontline uh, professional uh, how she would see this case, she would say that uh, that was not a case of child trafficking. Um, and if we compared it to other cases, they were even getting angry at us for seeing it as such. This is a problem, first of all, because this perception adds to, to the already existing stigma on uh, the Roma population, uh, which we are all aware of. But on the other hand, it blocks uh, effective identification and, um, and support for cases of child trafficking that are non-Roma cases. Um, and also the approach, the eventual approach, as I just said, uh, was different. Uh, a youth justice trajectory for native Dutch people focused on protection and support versus a criminal law approach with punishment and eventually even prison also for the children involved um, uh, for the Roma population. Besides that, we also observed a gender bias. Uh, we cannot generalize that because we had too little cases, but um, but we also expect, based on literature uh, signifying the same, um, the same thing, that this gendered bias was an exception to the rule. So we saw that girls are oftentimes seen as ideal victims that should be protected, whereas boys were often seen as so-called little rascals, and that's why I use that title, uh, who should be punished and uh, eventually would receive prison, even at ages of 12, to 14, and even while it's explicitly stated in international treatments that children who are victims of, um, who commit crimes uh, while they are victims of human trafficking should not be punished. 
So I think these were our most important findings, uh, Bobby, and uh, there's many more to tell, but I think this sums it up quite well. Yes, uh, I think so too. Thank you, Brenda. I would like to move on to uh, Catherine Sotis and Madeline Taylor uh, Diaz. Your, um, I, I know you have a presentation, you can share your, uh, your screen already if you want. Um, your article uh, is titled Ganged Up On, How the U.S. Immigration System Penalizes and Fails to Protect Central American Miners Who Are Trafficked for Criminal Activity by Gangs. So in a way, uh, it, it's similar to what Brenda was talking about or in terms of trafficking, but you focus on exploitation by, uh, by gangs. All right, thank you. Um, so I'm Katie Soltis, and uh, my co-author Madeline Taylor Diaz and I wrote this article um, based on our experience as immigration attorneys. We both work for a nonprofit called AYUDA, which is a um, nonprofit in the DC metropolitan area. Um, and we provide immigration legal services, social services, and language access services to low-income immigrants throughout the area. And our organization um, represents clients from all over the world, but in particular, we represent um, Central Americans who have been fleeing gang violence and other forms of violence in their home countries and who are seeking asylum and other forms of humanitarian protection in the United States. So as immigration attorneys, we have seen that um, many of our clients who are Central American minors were forced to engage in criminal activity by gangs in um, their home countries of El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala, and are often penalized by our immigration system for their past exploitation. So the U.S. Um, has obligations and has professed its commitment to protecting human trafficking victims under the Trafficking Victims Protection Act. However, our immigration law carries extreme consequences for criminal activity without regard for whether the activity was forced and without regard for um, the capacity of minors to commit crimes. Um, so we're, in our article, we draw from our experience working as immigration attorneys, and we provide examples of how our immigration system has penalized um, Central American minors for being victims of human trafficking and um, how our immigration system carries extremely harsh consequences for all criminal acts, even if it's a result of trafficking. Um, so in, in our presentation today, we'll just give a brief overview of the context um, of cent the Central American gang, gang crisis. Um, in our work, we see um, minors and family units who have fled Central America and who have turned themselves in to immigration authorities and then have been released to the Washington DC area and are um, pursuing immigration relief here. Thank you. So we begin our article um, by placing this issue of youth trafficked by the gangs in the context of the Central American refugee crisis largely. Um, and in the fact that hundreds of thousands of Central American children have entered, entered or attempted to enter the United States every year since 2014. We explore a bit the creation of the two largest gangs in Central America, MS-13 and the 18th Street Gang, and their inception in the United States. Um, in fact, their rise in power in Central America can be attributed in part to the deportation of immigrants from the US with criminal histories, in turn um, exporting gang culture to Central America and explore how that in fact is a consequence of the criminalization of immigrants in the United States and the policies which um, beginning around in the 80s which sought to deport immigrants that had criminal histories. Um, we have, one moment, please. We've observed in our work that, um, and it has been well documented as well, that poor and disenfranchised minors and young adults are, are targeted by the gangs and carry out many of the revenue building activities of MS-13 and 18th Street, such as um, low-level extortion and low-level drug sales. And those are the clients that we have encountered in our work that are often penalized by the US immigration system as a result of those activities in their home country or indeed in the United States and criminal activity in the United States. 
Um, we do note that there are many societal factors which can contribute to a minor's involvement in gangs, and that indeed there might be some aspect of voluntariness to some minor, minors' gang participation. However, the focus of our article is on um, trafficked youth. As Madeline was saying, um, a lot of the cases that we observe and that are documented in um, the research as well um, involve a spectrum of coercion. And um, at one end, youth may in, enter gangs voluntarily. Um, at the other end of this, the spectrum in the cases which we focus on in the article, the youth may um, face extreme levels of violence and extreme levels of violence against their family members for the gangs um, to force and coerce them into providing labor and services in the form of drug sales, committing other acts of violence um, for the gang and um, extortion, which are the main drug, drug sales and extortion are the main sources of revenue for the gang. Um, here we provided the definition of labor trafficking under US law and the TVPA and the definition of coercion we also know in our article that the definition of labor trafficking under US law is different than the definition under the Palermo Protocol, whereas the TVPA does not distinguish between adults and children with the definition of labor trafficking. So force, fraud, or coercion is required um, in order to prove labor trafficking for both adults and for children. And so we note that under US law, um, the children that we are representing would meet the definition of labor trafficking victims. However, um, many of these children, a lot of these children don't receive any protections and are instead penalized for their past um, victimization. And um, one of the main areas in which we see these penalties or these consequences occurring is in the area of inadmissibility, which is a legal term under the US immigration law. Um, a complex set of inadmissibility grounds governs who is and is not eligible for admission or lawful status in the United States. So people applying for immigration relief in the United States are subject to these Grounds and there are with the um, kind of our immigration and criminal systems are very intertwined in the U.S. and many of the inadmissibility grounds are related to criminal history. However, many of these criminal grounds of inadmissibility do not require a criminal conviction. Um, so here we have a list of some of the most common criminal grounds of inadmissibility. Um, one that is particularly noteworthy in this context is that anyone who the government has reason to believe may be a drug trafficker can be found to be inadmissible. And this can be based very loosely on any types of um, loose claims or, or um, allegations. It does not require a conviction. And it does not have any exceptions in many forms of immigration relief, even if it was the result of duress or um, force. So waivers are available for certain grounds of inadmissibility depending on the form of relief, but even if a waiver is available, an application can still be denied based on an applicant's criminal history. Um, and there is very little in ways of discretion when there are a lot of criminal grounds um, at play. So two of the main for forms of immigration relief we see um, for these Central American minors are the T visa and SI special immigrant juvenile status or SIJS. So the T visa is the main type of visa available in the United States for victims of trafficking. And it is the only form of immigration relief that provides an explicit waiver of inadmissibility grounds that result from human trafficking. However, this visa is with limited ex exceptions is available to individuals who are subjected to trafficking inside the US United States. So for many of our clients who are subjected to trafficking outside the United States, they're not eligible for this visa and are therefore not eligible for this waiver of inadmissibility. Many of our clients are instead eligible for special immigrant juvenile status, which is for um, minors who have been abused, abandoned, or neglected by one or both of their parents, 
Um, but this form of immigration relief has very, very few waivers available for criminal history. And we know in our article one case where a father forced his son to um, sell drugs on his behalf on, and on behalf of the 18th Street gang. And then he, when he applied for relief on the basis of this abuse by his father, he was denied because the government found he was a drug trafficker, even though this occurred under force and even though it occurred when he was under the age of 10. Um, next, Madeline will go on to asylum. Sure, I know that we just have maybe less than a minute. So I'll just um, highlight the rest of what we discuss are additionally bars um, to asylum, to the ability to obtain asylum that have no express infancy or duress exceptions written into the law. Um, we also discuss the exercise of the US government of detaining, including detaining in jail-like settings minors for activities that they might have carried out on behalf of a gang um, while they were being trafficked in home country that could render them um, to be held in detention for a long period of time. Um, and additionally, adults may be denied release from detention due to activities that they carried out as minors, again, with no duress or infancy um, exception written into the law and a lack of rigorous evidentiary standards um, and due process in the courts in which they might be able to defend themselves. Thank you, Madeline and Catherine. As with human trafficking in general, we know that inhumane, we can say, border policies, migration policies are actually uh, harming both uh, trafficked persons and at risk groups. Um, and, and the last four years were particularly hard in the US. Finally, I come to you, Nishat. Uh, your, your article is. Um, is titled commercial, commercial gestational surrogacies, surrogacy unraveling the threads between reproductive tourism and child trafficking. And, and you focus there uh, very much on the distinctions between child trafficking and international commercial gestational surrogacy. Can you tell us first why this is necessary? As um, you know, I think at first glance, we would all think trafficking surrogacy completely different issues. Well, indeed, yes, at first glance, it does seem so. Um, but uh, in my research, I found that there were two, two very compelling reasons to make this distinction. And the first is in the interests of some linguistic and conceptual clarity. So we've seen the language and framework of human trafficking being used to describe and construct narratives of um, commercial gestational surrogacy, or CGS, as I will refer to it. So it's not such a mouthful. Um, and we see this in the media. So we've seen headlines such as reject commercial surrogacy as another form of human trafficking or surrogate parenthood for money as a form of human trafficking. And we see it as well in academia where um, surrogacy is actively compared to modern trafficking or modern slavery. Um, and we see it also in the work of supranational governmental institutions where they link surrogacy to, to trafficking very directly. Um, however, trafficking in children and, or the sale of children um, as it's sometimes referred to um, in, the, in these rhetorical articles, um, are two very separate, albeit sometimes overlapping criminal offences. And in order to establish whether either offence has occurred, um, there are a specific set of legal and factual elements that have to be met. So we need to be quite mindful um, of what is actually meant in law when we talk about selling or trafficking children and ensure that these terms and the underlying conceptual framework that they also import um, are apposite in the context of CGS. Um, secondly, um, it's also a very practical issue because anti-trafficking laws are increasingly being used to actively police CGS. Um, so in practice too, the question arises um, as to whether this is the appropriate legal tool to use. And I'll give you a couple of recent examples. And um, I think one that got perhaps the most amount of publicity um, there's an example from Cambodia, where in 2018, 43 pregnant surrogates, along with a number of intermediaries, were arrested, detained and charged on human trafficking offences. Um, and the official position was, uh, and I quote, that these women intended to exchange their children for money. What we prioritise um, as the victim is the baby inside the mother. To bear a child and then sell it is very inhumane. Um, so that was the official Cambodian position. Um, 
And these women were eventually released from detention on the condition that they would keep and raise the children until the age of 18, the alternative being facing up to 15 years imprisonment. And this is despite the fact that these women were all gestational surrogates, um, primarily for Chinese commissioning or intended parents. So they weren't genetically related to the children that they were carrying, whereas the intended parents were either in whole or in part. Um, but Cambodia is not the only country that's using anti-trafficking law to police commercial surrogacy. Um, in 2018 as well, the Spanish government effectively stranded almost 30 families in Ukraine uh, when they ceased registering the births of babies born through surrogacy, citing possible me medical malpractice and uh, human trafficking as the reason. Now, neither charge was substantiated and the families were eventually allowed to come home but only after a long delay and a lot of expense. Um, Ukraine itself more recently, um, and Ukraine is a very popular destination for CGS, it has a very permissive legal framework. Um, Ukraine has also announced its intention to shut down its international CGS sector. Um, and this was very much prompted by the, the ongoing COVID pandemic. Um, so the, the travel restrictions and the closure of country borders meant that a lot of commissioning parents were unable to travel to Ukraine in order to be there for the birth of their babies and to collect them and bring them home. So the surrogate having delivered the baby was off on her way and the intended parents were unable to get to Ukraine. So we have these stranded babies. One clinic reported up to 50 stranded babies at one moment. Um, and I think this really shone a spotlight on the extent of the CGS sector in Ukraine um, and the officials were, were shocked. Um, the Ukraine um, Ombudsman for Children described the situation as a violation of children's rights, stopping just short of calling it child trafficking, but going almost there. Um, and finally, the most, um, the most recent example I could find um, comes from Russia. And reports have recently emerged from Russia that gay men who have used surrogacy services in order to form a family may face arrest and charges of child trafficking and their children may be taken into custody. Um, in Russia, fertility doctors have also been arrested on trafficking charges after one of the um, pandemic stranded surrogate babies died of SIDS whilst in intermediary care. So the parents were unable to, to be there. Um, and there is an international arrest warrant out for the CEO of the surrogacy agency in charge. Um, so, so you can see that there are a number of examples where anti-trafficking laws are being used to, to police CGS. And the issue that we're now faced with is when do CGS arrangements fall within the category of legitimate medical or reproductive tourism? And when do they amount to human trafficking? Because it's the same set of actions and, and motivations that are one day characterized as cross-border tourism and for, for reproductive services and the next day characterized as trafficking. So we need to know when we're exercising our rights as a private global citizen um, and when we're engaging in serious criminal activity. Um, and I think the examples that I've, that I've given um, really demonstrate the consequences of this shift. So we have families stranded abroad, families unable to unite intended parents separated from their children, surrogates targeted and punished and left with children that they did not intend to raise. Um, and in the middle of all of this is a child whose best interests, far from being the primary focus, um, is then pushed into the background. So I think uh, clarifying the distinction between CGS and human trafficking um, and also clarifying the place of anti-trafficking law within the broader framework of regulating CGS merits some attention. Thank you, Nishat. And um, just briefly, then, uh, I I think these were really interesting examples. You uh, you explained very well. But then, briefly, is uh, CGS trafficking, child trafficking, or not? Because you uh, you make a meticulous analysis, uh, I I would say, of international law, which. Um, um, the audience, I hope, will we'll read your article, but give us a, a teaser. Uh, sure. So we need to look to international law um, for this, as I'm focused on cross-border surrogacy. And the, uh, the relevant law um, is the Trafficking Protocol, and it's Article 3, Subsection A that I look to. 
Um, so if we apply this, um, and I actually should, should point out that in this, um, in my article, I focus on the child as the victim of trafficking rather than the woman. So in traditionally, um, anti-trafficking discourses have looked at the woman as a victim of trafficking. But here, the, it's, a, it's a shift in the way in which the arrangement is perceived and the child is seen as the, the victim. The surrogate and, and or the intended parents are seen as the traffickers. So it's a, it's a different way of looking at the issue. Very briefly, if we go through the elements of Article 3A um, and see, see how they apply to the CGS, where the child is seen as the victim, first of all, um, we, have, we have to show the act. Um, and so arguably, we could say that transferring the child or the children from the surrogate to the commissioning parents or to the intermediary, if they are involved in the, um, the transport, harboring or receipt of children, could constitute the act that we need to show. Um, secondly, we've got, so we have to show the means. Now, following Article 3, subsection B, this element isn't actually required to be met because the person being trafficked is a child. Um, but that said, um, we could argue that the payments or benefits to the surrogate as the person in control of the child, um, both physically and in some cases legally as well, um, or to the, the payments or benefits to the intermediaries um, in cases where children are in intermediary care before being transferred to the, to the commissioning parents could constitute the means. Um, and finally, we come to the purpose, and we need, we need to show that the child was trafficked for the purposes of exploitation. And, and here, I think, is where the argument collapses, because children who are brought about by a commercial surrogacy are, are very much wanted. They're often very long awaited, and they're welcomed overwhelmingly into, into homes where families are prepared to, to care for them. And they, are, they have brought about these children in order to have a, a very happy and fulfilling family life. There's no inherent expectation of subsequent exploitation in CGS, just as there's no inherent expectation of subsequent exploitation in, in instances where the parent's genetic, gestational and intentional parenthood coincides. So unless there's evidence to the contrary that the purpose for which the children were born through surrogacy and then were transferred to the commissioning parents um, was an exploitative one, we do not meet the elements of Article 3A, and therefore I don't think that, um, that tracking is established under, under that law. Thank you very much, uh, Nisha. Um, so we, we have about 10 minutes left, uh, and I see that our panelists responded to several questions already in the Q&A chat box, uh, and there are no active questions. I would like to ask Brenda to, to share a little bit about, we, we have three more articles in the issue uh, whose authors uh, couldn't join us at this presentation. So if you can share very briefly, Bren, about uh, each of them. Um, well, first, one of the, uh, larger articles is that of uh, Bernard Crimson and Davuda Abdullahi, and um, they write about the training of minors, the kind of uh, local informal training uh, that they have, that they get in the fishing communities on Lake Volta in Ghana. So you could also read this article together with the one of uh, that Sam uh, O'Hier was just presenting. Um, and I'm particularly happy with this article as it perfectly illustrates the added value of local empirical study of the phenomenon um, as a kind of nuance or, or alternative vision to the Western dominated hegemonic ways of seeing this phenomenon. They show how um, locally um, the local population differentially, differentially sorry, uh, conceptualizes a, what is a child? And B, what constitutes trafficking? And they point out very briefly that we should look rather at social age, um, except for only the legal age, which is a minor is someone below 18 years of age. Um, but the social age can be really different. For example, in this village, when a child would achieve 13 years old, uh, they were considered to have the physical. Um, uh, posture and so on to start this fishery training, uh, also considering the fact that they have already been trained from a very young age on in their own community. And we also would need to focus, according to them, on reducing the harm 
in, um, in, in, in fishing, uh, instead of removing kids entirely from the economic, um, from economic activities, as that would rather harm their living conditions rather than uh, improve them. So that was the article of um, um, Kumsum and Abdullahi. Um, there were two short articles that you asked me to go into, uh, Bobby, that were the one of Elia Duristin and Emily van der Meulen uh, on Canada. In, and Canada is interesting here because the, lots of things are happening there as far as, as sex work regulation and, and, uh, and so on are concerned. Um, and their article are about how the human trafficking concerns in this country shifted from a focus on Eastern European women to a focus on the sexual exploitation of Canadian young girls and women. And the focus on young girls um, now becomes superimposed, according to their argument, on adult women, leading to an infantil infantilization of adult women and a criminalization of consensual um, adult sex work which is a harming um, their, um, their, uh, um, their position legally and, and uh, mostly legally and socially. Um, so that's the article of uh, Elia Durisin and Emily van der Meulen on Canada. And there is another short article of Melinda Gill, um, which is about online child sexual exploitation in the Philippines. And uh, that is also very timely, I would say, as alarming messages has, have um, arrived on online sexual exploitation, taking a big leap in Corona times uh, for understandable reasons. Um, they addressed, uh, they, they um, argued how in their country, in the Philippines, uh, the phenomenon of online se child sexual exploitation is mainly addressed by raid and rescue missions because it's conceptualized as children that are forced by family members or other adults to create sexual content online. However, according to Melinda, um, there is a lot of uh, creation of sexual content uh, online going on, which is actually created by um, minors, teenagers, um, who do that autonomously or with their peers. And um, this, this thing questions, again, like we have done in other articles, the issue of agency of children and the issue of should we focus on child trafficking as a framework in a criminal law way, or should we rather focus on the issue of harm? What harm is actually done and by whom? Um, so that's the article of Melinda Gill. Jill, sorry. Thank you, Bren. I, I actually don't know how her name is pronounced, how her last name is pronounced. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, but I think I think uh, another uh, her other point, which uh, stuck with me, was that rather than rescue and uh, you know and raids and awareness raising campaigns to address the issue, it needs to be addressed through education. Um, including education on sexual health and rights uh, among young people, both girls and boys, and uh, you know the, through social support programs that um, assist children and their families, and so all of these um, uh, you know sort of larger issues that basically to address the root causes of the problem rather than um, uh, just remove the. Um, uh, or yeah, remove the children or arrest their parents. Yeah, it seems like there are no active questions, but if um, any of the other panelists uh, would like to say one minute each. Um, yes, thank you, Bobby. I think I, I just want to sort of highlight the, um, um, you know, where we left off in our paper, i.e. underscoring the importance of um, social welfare provisions working hand in hand with community or grassroots um, um, organizations to address the issues facing children, as opposed to top down um, criminal justice um, led interventions, which do not always in the to 
the um, benefit or best interest of the children um, involved. I see Mike is giving the <laughs> thumbs up. I, I agree. This is this is sort of like a common thread, I think, through through many of the articles uh, in the issue that we find. Indeed. Yeah. Just to absolutely repeat the same, which is that we've been stuck now for 20 years thinking that, that police who are very good at cer policing certain things uh, can somehow deal with issues of uh, economic life concerning adolescents or or even younger children. They're not the right people either to get involved in preventive action or even in protection. Uh, and uh, we've been shouting, but clearly not long, loud enough for 20 years that the only people attached to the state apparatus who should be identifying and deciding what happens to traffic children are child protection specialists, people who know what they're, they're about, uh, not uh, people who, who, who are very good frontline cops um, and, and you know that's the, the experience in relation to lots of issues with children so it's not astounding but it does seem that not only in my country but everywhere else that government officials have cotton wool stuffed in their ears and can't listen. Yes, I just wanted to uh, to uh, also thank everyone who's here and um, just a very short remark as we have been saying, Bobby and I, that empirical research on this phenomenon is so scarce. Um, I suppose there are some researchers uh, among the public. I don't know all of you, but uh, if you are doing empirical research and uh, you are interested in this topic and you want to share further, uh, please um, uh, give me a message via email. Um, you can find it in the journal um, because I think it's paramount that we have more good research being done on this issue. Thank you all. Thank you, Bren. And um, yes, thank you to everyone who, who joined. Um, have a great rest of your day and um, yeah, and good night uh, wherever you. you are. <laughs> thank you, Bobby. Take care. Bye. Okay, bye bye. Thank you. Thanks, goodbye. Bye. Bye-bye, thank you all.